Yeah, me too. The older I get. Well, good afternoon and welcome to a budget work session on uh, public works. Um, we are going to get started and hopefully we'll have more council members joining us at some point. Um, so welcome. If you'll start us out, um, Director Nimichek, that would be great. Thank you. Today we are having the public works budget work session for FY 2025. I'll start with introductions. Um, I am Vicki Nemechek and I'm the Public Works Director. I am Greg Lavoie and I'm the Deputy Public Works Director. And I'd also like to the staff to introduce themselves. If all of the Public Works uh, people from division managers and would stand. And, and if you'd introduce yourself so that they could hear, please. Bill Gonzalez, manager of competition. Okay, thanks everybody, if you could sit. I uh, would like to do one more little thing before I start going through the budget book. Um, any one of the staff that was just standing, if you have more than 10 years with the city, would you please stand? If you have more than 20 years with the city, please remain standing. If you have more than 30 years, remain standing. If you have more than 40 years, remain standing. Okay, you can sit, thanks. <laughs> These are the hardest people in the city, hardest working people in the city that you'll never see. That's just the way it is. We public works people uh, nationally are just not seen very much, but they're hardworking, they do things that are essential to the city. And I would just like to say that public works employees, probably more than any other department, benefited from the recent wage adjustments. And this is only a small group of, of public works employees who benefited from those adjustments. On behalf of all of the department employees, I'd like to say thank you for approving a pay plan that is both fair and transparent and has relieved the compression that we've all felt over the last two decades. We truly appreciate your support and thank you for having the, ver the vision to see how this pay plan will make a difference to both current and future employees. So thank you. So I will start with the general fund budget, which is which starts on page 116. Our public works administration, traffic maintenance, facilities maintenance and street and alley General fund budgets are primarily made up of payroll, utilities, and fleet costs, which include fuel, labor, and parts. Additionally, facilities maintenance includes maintenance contracts for elevators, HVAC service, garage door maintenance, electricians, plumbers, roofers, et cetera. Facilities maintenance also provides necessary supplies such as toilet paper, paper towels, and cleaning supplies to all city agencies. Increases in our general fund budget are primarily due to inflation for commodities and services. The traffic maintenance budget includes one additional traffic technician. This is our only request for additional personnel this year. As the city grows, requirements to maintain traffic signals, traffic signs, and paint grow. This, addition, this additional employee will provide the resources they need to maintain the additional infrastructure. So um, I'd just like to go through the Public Works Administration is uh, uh, on page 116 and 17, and I'm happy to answer any questions on those particular budgets. Just a quick question. This may be off topic, but what is the uh, total number of employees in the report to Public Works? Approximately 150 full-time employees and another 20, between 20 and 30 uh, part-time employees. We have permanent part-time in transit. We have some in uh, fleet, one in fleet, um, the others are seasonal employees, so they fluctuate depending on the season, but about, about 180 
ish. Thank you. Which would, if my calculations are correct, is about one third of all city employees. Right. So go public works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any questions for Director Nimacek? Uh, page one sixteen and one seventeen. Hey, the general fund traffic budget is on page 118 and 18 and 19. And again, really not uh, anything significant here except for the additional person that will be a traffic technician that is proposed. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilman Johnson. I guess just a definition because this the traffic engineer reports to Tom Cobb. So um, is what does this actual department do? Do you chair, uh, this is the maintainers. We, the traffic engineer and engineering tells us, I always like to explain it as engineering tells us what to do, we're the doers. So we paint the streets, we repair the signals, we fix the timing on traffic signals. We uh, change out signs. We order signs. Everything that in the right of way that uh, revolves around those three things, we do. Any other questions for Director Nemechek? Okay. On page 120 and 121 is the facilities maintenance uh, general fund budget. Uh, again, we one thing that you'll notice is that there was a one-time decrease of 700 and where is that number? $754,000. That was the equipment that we purchased with uh, HVAC equipment that we purchased in a uh, conjunction with the new contract. So that de that was a significant decrease. Other than that, there are real, there are really no significant changes. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilman Esquivel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, Director Nemechek, uh, during one of our earlier budgets, we asked uh, CRE how many buildings they had. And they said they had about 10 or 12. And then in the mayor's minute, he said we have about 50 buildings that we take care of. And then also in one time expenses, we see some deferred maintenance in there. Uh, what was the top issue that didn't make the budget? We did ask for a roof um, that was budgeted. The You mean just facilities wise? Yeah. Are we catching up with our deferred I maintenance? Think it, I think the additional request was for more people. I did not put that in the budget. We, uh, I, I felt that the traffic position was the most important, but we never really have enough people or enough time to manage the 50 facilities that we have. To follow up, Madam Chair, so a few years back, we were a little bit behind the eight ball on deferred maintenance, and so we're catching up now. Uh, through you, Chair, we are catching up, but we're, I would, we are nowhere near caught up. Okay. Right. Councilman Roybal? If, if I remember right, that uh, that list we had was around 400 million. The needs the, the CIP yeah. portion. Ooh. Is that right? Steve is acknowledging that you are correct. <laughs> We've done a lot, but a, just a single roof these days. I think the uh, our estimate is four hundred fifty thousand for the fire headquarters roof that we're that we asked for this year. Any other questions from committee? Yes. Oh, Councilman Johnson. So I guess on that part. Are we, if we have 50 buildings, and I know that this came up with the ICE and Event Center where we asked, posed the question, if, we, but I was told that some of these buildings would operate better under live industrial and things like that. Have we ever thought about, con since we have such a large overhead on our capital improvement projects, uh, consolidating into certain buildings and then liquidating others? Or is every single building that we have out of, in your department, absolutely necessary for the operations of the city uh, through you chair we have less space than we need not more we our 
located in a multitude of areas. Um, one thing that I would say that in the future is we need to look for land and a building that we and build a building that would suit all of public works there. You can be more efficient um, if you do that. The we we actually were talking to the airport. They have a building over there that's uh, that they want to tear down, but they're not interested in selling the land. That was something that we. This is something we've been looking at, but uh, it's economically it would be a significant uh, amount of money. But most cities, most municipal, not most municipalities, but uh, an increasing number of municipalities are building public works centers that house all of public works. Any other questions? Uh, President Escobel. So then we're not renting any buildings currently. Through you, Chair, we rent a, we rent a build, not a building. We rent space for uh, storing our cold mix and things like that across the street from the street and alley division. We also, are there other rentals? No, I can, that's the only one I can think of is that, is that rental where we rent space for, uh, and it's not a building, it's ground. And follow up just how much do we pay a year for that? Uh, through you, Chair, $12,000 a year. So I have a question for you, Director Nemechek. Um, one of the things that I've really um, become aware of is that um, the building that the street and alley crew is currently occupying is really not sufficient for the work they do, nor is the one um, where they're doing repairs um, or fleet maintenance. Um, so it, it, as you're looking, as we're looking ahead at Sixpenny projects, um, are you planning to put either one of those forward on um, as a potential project? The We have um, talked to the mayor about what uh, we need and the street and alley facility we need to expand. We also need to uh, build what we think is best would be to build a lube shop, um, an additional uh, building that would have a pit and several areas. We are working with Winters Griffith at this time to come up with numbers um, on what those would cost to build, some estimates, so that we can move forward with looking for funding. Six penny money at this point, our biggest request is the municipal building. Okay, which we won't know more on until we get the space study back. Correct? In aug uh, late August, beginning of September. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Well, I, I will just say that the uh, maintenance, fleet maintenance building they're working in, we would never approve that for school facilities um, to have people working in that condition because it's really unsafe in a lot of ways. Um, so I hope that you'll consider that as we move forward along with the need for that street and alley building. Any other questions? Okay. And the last portion of our general fund on page 122 and 123 is street and alley. Again, this is primarily just uh, payroll and a few other small items, so there's no significant changes here. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Councilman Johnson. Okay. First, not that it matters, there's a spelling error on the first bullet. Alley has an E in it. So not that that matters really all that much, but the um, other question I have is more of a technical one. Um, I've been, instead of sending you emails to create work orders for me, I've been using the app or the website to report a concern. And I ask individuals, because when I thought when I had a Galaxy, I was able to do attachments to actually show a graphic. And so looking through the website last night on the Greenway, I can actually geolocate an issue on the Greenway part, but it does not allow me on the... Um, on the report of concern for a pothole to actually add a graphic or a JPEG or anything like that where I believe it used to. So instead of sending you photos through email, I was hoping if you could look into the website again to see if we could add images on there. And I guess I've turned in so many now that last night was the first night I had to identify as a stoplight and a bus 
because I turn in so many that it was making sure I wasn't a robot. So I guess those are just my two <laughs> concerns on reporting a concern for the city's website. So I don't have to bother you because I do get my work orders, you know, on when I know it's completed mm -hmm. that I have them. So I save all those to my phone. So I know if you guys do contact me, I know which work order mm -hmm. you're addressing, but that's just something I thought we should probably add back into the website. Uh, through you, Chair, when the website changed, um, we had a report of concern. It's always been called report of concern. But um, when the website changed a few years ago, that uh, that whole system changed. And we are looking at, an at an another change with the OpenGov cartograph um, uh, uh, implementation. And we'll be using C-Click Fix. C-Click Fix is more robust and will you will be able to add uh attach things to it okay because i the only reason i even knew that this was a past feature is because when scott and i went and taught third graders um i was teaching them how to report a pothole on their streets <laughs> and i guess gps and all that is taught in fourth grade not third grade so the teacher called me out but um that was the only reason i knew that that functionality existed when scott and i taught so i was wondering it i thought it was because i actually went to an apple instead of my Samsung. Yeah. So I didn't know if that was a functionality that was gone. So when um, can we expect that add on to be put back into the web page? Uh, through you, Chair, I hope that we can get C Click Fix on board soon, but it is, uh, we are in the process of implementation now with uh, bringing in street and alley traffic and fleet maintenance. Uh, we've got a few things to do before we can get to the C-click fix. Okay, any other questions? Moving forward. Okay, transit. We'll move to page 216 and talk about the transit fund. The Cheyenne Transit Program is funded primarily with FTA, state, county, and local grants. The city provides matching funds to these grants via a general fund transfer. We are requesting a transfer from the general fund of $1,010,000. 216. 216 and 217. We have utilized 100% CARES funds over the last few years with COVID. Um, we did not, those funds did not require a match. So we have not been using match money recently. Um, but those funds have been completely expended. The increase from 400,000 to 600,000 um, in our operations match is due to costs of reestablishing route service plus continuing micro transit service and the paratransit service. We're also requesting $410,000 in match money for a grant to complete renovations at 1800 Westland. Uh, UP Railroad has moved out. The design is complete, both interior and exterior. And, we're, and we are currently moving forward with an access agreement with Magic City for the shared entrance to our facilities. So I am, uh, again, 216 and 217. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. It does go through. Sorry, Councilman Cook online. I, I raised my hand. I didn't hear if you guys heard, saw that or not. Yes, sir. Um, Madam Chair, through you, if I may, to uh, Director Nemechek. Um, Vicky, I apologize. I'm not there in the room with all of you today. I hope I hope you can hear me. I apologize if if you can't. Um, I can. You cannot. I can hear you very um, well. Thank you, Director. I apologize. Um, anyway, I've just I I I think I heard all of your presentation, but I I had a question again. I'm I'm on two page two eighteen, Director. Um, and I was wondering, uh, in the transit fund, I was uh, wondering about the amount of two million fifty four dollars and and uh, uh, or two million fifty four and seven hundred dollars in uh, funds budgeted for buildings. I was wondering if you could explain what what that is. Um, through you, Chair, that is the money for the eighteen hundred Westland renovations it's a grant plus the four hundred and ten thousand dollars that we're asking for for uh match money okay um 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Madam Chair, I, I do have one more. I'm not sure if, if that's okay, Madam Chair, if I may through you. Absolutely. Um, Director, I'm not sure where this one would go, but I also wanted to ask about um, the new, I guess we would call it the, the new main bus stop um, on O'Neill. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Director, if we will be uh, spending any money or making any kind of infrastructure upgrades to that area, whether uh, there will be a, any kind of a shelter on the way, benches, uh, permanent restrooms, anything like that. Or I, I just I've seen that. I I, um, I just was wondering if we're going to be making any upgrades with that with that area. It looks looks pretty shabby right now. Through you, Chair, that is a temporary transfer point on O'Neill at this uh, right now. When we open 1800 Westland, that as a transfer center, that will become just a simple tra uh, bus stop. There will be no restrooms there right now. We are um, changing out our the restroom facility for passengers to a handicap uh, porta potty, and there's. Uh, and it'll be temporary. We'll be paying for it monthly until we can get into 1800 Westland. And uh, thank you, Director. One one last one last question, and I appreciate that. So I, what I'm hearing you say is it's it's not intended to be the the per, the permanent stop, which is that that's good to hear. Um, I guess going back on the Westland Road property, um, what is your timeline for completion and and being able to go into that building? Through you, Chair, that's a great question. Um, we have we will have to bid out the work on on that. Um, we're looking at a year. Uh, we're looking at a year from now um, before we could get into that, and I think that would be a best case scenario. Okay. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Director Nimichek on? Transportation, Councilman Johnson. Councilman Laborn. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Director Nemechek, um, I'm very interested in the issues that uh, Councilman Cook just raised. If we're not going to have that full functioning um, facility over there on Westland Road, and we're going to continue to um, use the <clears throat> temporary site. Um, I, re I really agree that uh, it needs much more attention than it's got, and certainly a uh, handicap accessible porta potty would be an improvement over the ones that are there now, which clearly do not meet ADA. But um, have we looked at any um, further? Uh, ability to rent a uh, better restroom facility. I, I see them in uh, other places uh, in, in areas that uh, are probably don't, aren't permanent, but are um, used extensively. Um, that just, uh, and, and I speak as the uh, council representative for the mayor's council with people with disabilities. Um, that's just utterly inadequate, and uh, certainly uh, when you look at, uh, as I, I guess I'll go down there and take another look at it, but um, I don't believe there's a curb ramp there. So the bus pulls up, an individual with uh, a disability has to somehow get up over the curb and into what I understand will be in the future a accessible uh Porta potty. Well, uh, that isn't really um, um, what I think we should be doing for the next year. I mean, if it's uh, going to be a year till we have that new facility, which obviously is going to fulfill a lot of needs, um, I feel very strongly that we need to pay attention to that and look at what could be done in a more serious manner and and i i speak as a uh 
individual that's recently experienced uh, disability changes the way you think. And I don't think anybody in this room or in the city that was trying to get out of a chair at that site without a curb ramp into a uh, portable, porta potty uh, accessible, which are not much bigger or much different from the uh, regulars, um, would find that satisfactory. I, I just really don't. It's a, uh, um, would it be possible for us to look at other options? Through you, Chair, uh, other options as in a, te a different temporary facility? I, I, I mean, you could do anything. The question is always at what cost? Correct. Um, so no, yes, it would be temporary. Um, I'll be doing some research on this with uh, hopefully some other members who are pretty savvy on the Mayor's Council for People with Disabilities. Um, but <clears throat> as it is now, um, I look forward to communicating with you about it. And uh, I think the point is when you look at the amount of money and the amount of effort that we put into the transit program and how critical it is to those individuals that use it, um, <clears throat> that and, and I'm glad to know that it's we're reached the point where we're going to be uh, finalizing that um, property out on Westland Road. Um, I just don't believe that in Wyoming's climate, in that area, in all our various weathers, in all of those very critical personal private needs that people have, uh, that that's adequate. So I look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you. Director Nemechek, um, right now those uh, temporary restrooms are on the sidewalk, I believe. Um, and, it, and we do not own the parking lot behind those, correct? That's correct, we do not. Because I have seen um, Councilman Laybourne um, modular porta potties. I know that Visit Cheyenne has used some of their events um, that are located out in um, in the uh, in a ranch farming area for some events that they've had um, that are much nicer and much more accessible, but they're so wide. I don't know. I mean, we'd have to rent space, I'm guessing, from that parking lot because they wouldn't fit on the sidewalk for sure, which presents its own issue that we're blocking the sidewalk. Councilman Johnson. Okay, so on page 217, can you tell me... Um, where are the bus drivers actually fit in this? Are they under the regular employees section or under the temporary part-time? Where do they fall? Through you, Chair, they would fall under regular employees. Okay. And how many do we have? 14, 10, 9. Not part-timers, full-timers. 10, 10 full-time. 10, 10 full-time. Okay. Bus drivers. So the reason I ask um, how many we actually had is um, after... I did the drug form. Um, a person wrote to me stating that they had um, had actually witnessed um, drug selling in the bus. And so do those come equipped with cameras? I imagine they would. I thought I remembered seeing them on when I walked or went on the bus. And so um, what is do we have a procedure in place where if nefarious activities take place on the bus that this is actually reported? To CPD, because I know I, mm -hmm. I just forwarded the email that I got to um, Renee as well as the chief of police and Captain James to kind of look into this. But I mean, uh, when I wrote back to the constituents stating that I had turned it into transit and as well as the police department, they kind of felt that that wasn't really the bus driver's responsibility to act as an informant to the police department. So I didn't know how we were going to resolve this issue. It seemed like it was kind of revolving, but. That is something that has been brought up. So how do we go about reporting concerns like that um, from our own staff to PD? Through you, Chair. Uh, yes, we have video inside and outside our buses. Um, not every single point. We don't, uh, I don't think most of our buses have back, have videos. They don't have videos that face backwards, but they do forwards, sides, and interior. Um, of the driver and the passengers. 
the uh, when we have an incident, absolutely the bus driver reports that to dispatch. Dispatch then takes appropriate action. We have uh, we have a a lot of things happen on the bus. Right. It's true, and we do um, take action for those and and uh, report those as appropriate. Okay. And then um, I guess I was looking once again on the website. So if someone does, because I know how we kind of handle school zones and stuff with the, you know, your panel that you guys meet roughly once a month, you know, to discuss safety issues and things. How does somebody actually report a concern if they want an additional bus stop near like a specific facility or anything? I know we, I think pre pandemic, we did an evaluation on more effectiveness. And then as you stated with a lot of the, COVID funds, you know, it was more of the, I think, it, what is it? It's not called spot to spot. What is it? Curb to curb is what it's called. Yeah. So everybody was doing curb to curb, you know, and that seemed to work fairly well. But if we get back into the route system, instead of doing so much curb to curb, um, how do, for one, I guess, how do they approach getting a, a new location for a bus stop? And what's the procedure that, you know, the city takes to what to evaluate if it's necessary? Through you, Chair, we uh, recently did the uh, transit development plan. We went through uh, the entire route system, where the stops should be, um, how far apart they were, and then we supplement that with micro transit service. So now we have the four routes. We we've implemented all of those four routes. We have micro transit that supplements those four routes. So if you're not within a quarter of a mile of those routes, you may call. Microtransit. Microtransit is uh, there is a fee of a dollar fifty for a microtransit ride, but the route service is free. So um, if they if there are additional stops that people want, they certainly can um, put that in. We have online. They can do it uh, personally. They can call dispatch. They can call the director. They can call me. Um, any number of ways that they can uh, put that in. But at this point, um, we just recently went through that entire process of where those stops would be. Okay. And then as far as your micro transit, cause I remember that. So was that kind of like a city ran Uber Lyft deal between it? Cause you said, I know that you said as far as the, the actual bus mm -hmm. routes, but on the micro transit, is that something that the bus driver sets up for the individual? Or is that something they do online when they make their order? How's that work? Through you, Chair, we have a we have an app that they can use to schedule those rides. We they can call dispatch and schedule those rides. Um, that's mainly the the way that you get those set up micro transit rides. What's the and, app called? What's that? It's just Google, isn't it? Yeah, on from the website directly, and then. You click the link and it'll take you to order a ride. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So for people that are online, what she just said was go to the Cheyenne Transit uh, app. You can download an app from the app store called Cheyenne Transit, and then that would give you that access for those micro trans uh, micro. Right. When you when you search on your app, uh Play, you know, Play Store, whatever it call, it's called, um, and you put in Cheyenne Transit, our app will pop up. Any other questions for Director Nemechek about transportation or transit fund? I did have one question. I see that the um, temporary part-time is proposed to jump um, by about 25%, actually even more than that, from 300,000 to 499,000. Um, how many part-time, um, I'm guessing this is all part-time bus drivers or part-time employees? That's that's correct. And do you know how many we have? We have 14 slots. Before COVID, we had 17 actual part-time drivers. We've uh, taken that back some. Um, and we currently have 10 filled. It's difficult to fill those part-time positions. We've done some different things to be able to get up to 10. Um, and we hope to be, this would be what it would cost us if we could fully staff the part-time positions. Thank you. And my other question has been, um, I know that the last time I had checked, the ridership was growing, 
um, but we hadn't implemented all four routes at that point. So um, are we seeing that we are having all four routes utilized and is the ridership growing? Um, especially with the free, because rides are free now. So yes, absolutely. We're seeing um, more riders. We're uh, we're we have a we're waiting on putting in some software to to count riders. That's what uh, we don't have great counts right now because it's the bus drivers trying to keep count of people going on going off. So we're uh, when we get that in, we'll we'll definitely forward those results and get get those numbers out to you. But yes, we're seeing an increased ridership and the free has made a made a big difference. Free rides are a big difference. And my last question is, uh, I believe it's Alliance Club has implemented a uh, transit service for people going to and from medical appointments. Um, are we collaborating or coordinating at all with them um, on their free transportation service? Great. So there, we're not being redundant. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Nemechek? Okay, next page number. Page 228 through 233 is the 1% sales tax budget. We are in the second year of budgeting for the 23 to 26 1% uh, sales tax, commonly known as the fifth penny. The estimated collection over the four-year period is $50 million. Each year, we budget $12,500,000, along with some interest and overage funds to cover the cost of, of, of administering the tax, as outlined in Resolution 6248. Budgets for fire, PD, CRE, miscellaneous budgets, street and road maintenance budgets remain virtually the same over the four-year period. Um, I'm happy to go through that budget if you wish. But or just take questions. Are there any questions from committee? Uh, yes, Councilman Cook. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, uh, through you to uh, Director Nemechek. Um, Director, I did have uh, a few questions for you, if I may, um, starting on page 229 under the, uh, the admin costs. Um, I saw the budgeted amount of thirty-eight thousand, uh, which is uh, or a thirty-eight thousand dollar increase in professional services. I was wondering what uh, what that was related to. I don't have the specifics of that, but I can get those. I can get okay. that for you. Thank you, Director, and and that's. Um, Madam Chair, I'm I'm okay with that if they provide that at a later later time. I'm not I'm not gonna not gonna hold this process up, but uh, we would appreciate that, Director. Um, also, again, I was I was also wondering maybe along those same lines, uh, ten thousand dollar increase in general discretionary funds. Actually, that's the same uh, through you, Chair. That's the same as it was last year. What are those? The, actually, we put that in there in case there's something that comes in over budget that we can okay. transfer. It's okay. just, just an, a kind of an overage account that we and, use if we must. Okay. And then, um, Madam Chair, through you, uh, follow up to that. Uh, and, Director, this may be related as well. Uh, $20,065 uh, transferred to other funds. I'm just wondering what that what that entails as well i believe that's the allocation um to that goes to pay for the for hr services for treasurer services for all of the things that we that we use from this fund but uh and it pays back those it pays for those services and then, Madam Chair, I, I swear I only have one more. And thank you, Director. I appreciate that. Madam Chair, I do have one more, and then I'll shut up. Okay. Um, <laughs> which I think you'll all probably appreciate. Um, um, Director, I, um, I'm looking at uh, page uh, 232 um, under the street and alley. And it looked like there was a, a reduction director in the uh, 
asphalt and uh, salt supplies. Uh, uh, looked like there was a five hundred thousand uh, dollar decrease in that. I just Thank was yeah. wondering what what that's about, Director. Through you, Chair, what the what we have is money that will roll over from zero to one. We have been using the previous year's fund to pay for some of those expenses. So we budgeted last year for both um, asphalt and ice, uh, ice slicer or salt. And right. um, those funds haven't been used, so they'll roll over. So we oh. did not budget in those accounts. Oh, so that's just due to the, the decrease in this year is just due to the rollover from last year. Okay. Right. Thank you, Director. And thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Any other questions for Director, Director Nemechek on the 1% uh, sales tax fund? Okay. Fleet okay. maintenance is on page 244 through 246. 244 to 246. Fleet maintenance is an internal service fund. The city's fleet maintenance fund uh, is an internal service fund. Revenue for this from this, well, revenue for this fund comes from reimbursements from various funds and departments for parts, labor, and fuel. The fund must cover all fleet maintenance expenses, including long-term expenses like replacing service vehicles and equipment, as well as facility maintenance and improvements. We did increase labor rates last year, primarily due to an upcoming pavement project at fleet maintenance that will cost $647,706. And that is uh, asphalt and concrete around the area that everyone uses. Um, we also need to make long-term plans to replace vehicles that service our fleet and update fuel systems at multiple locations. Past rates did not support these expenditures. We also budgeted a 5% increase in parts and fuel for fiscal year 2025. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Councilman Johnson. So I believe Dr. Aldrich asked this last year. So just as a kind of a reminder in regards to this, um, have we kind of planned um, to as far as the EV market that our techs are actually prepared to deal with this in case we actually go to EVs for some of our fleet? Through you, Chair, at this point, we're looking into it, but we're not investing in it. Um, we don't believe that the infrastructure is ready for us to do that. We don't believe that there is adequate even energy available at this time, if we if we changed over our vehicles to EV at this point, it would be very costly. EV vehicles are more um, expensive. Plus, they we would need more of them to actually do the jobs um, for an entire day. For example, a bus uh, runs from six in the morning until seven at night, and we would need two buses uh, because you don't have the time in between to. Uh, charge those vehicles. So um, we have in the past uh, used CNG at our natural gas at our for our transit buses, and again the the whole entire process was not uh, just didn't work for our bus system. We've you we've purchased hybrid vehicles for um, our street and alley division. We've purchased some for some of the other divisions, and we found that they just don't we we end up using only the gas portion um and they're more expensive so we've not really moved into that market yet although we are doing a lot of research and a lot of discussion when we attend conferences there's a lot of discussion about um what's up and coming our other problem is really that it's difficult to buy those vehicles if california is buying 100 evs Nobody wants to sell us one. So it's kind of a, it's, you know, supply and demand. There are a lot of things right now. Uh, we know where we're going. We understand where we're going eventually. But at this point, we're researching, but not, but not taking action. Councilman Escudo. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, through you. So yesterday with County Emergency Management, we had the opportunity to attend the Integrated Preparedness Planning Workshop. And some questions came up uh, about the, the snowstorm we had a few years back. And some Snow of the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some of the communication breakdowns that we had with uh, emergency personnel uh, in our uh, snow plows and the trucks and everything to get certain routes cleared. Uh, what have we done to improve that communication between all these emergency management personnel? Through you, Chair, uh, when the police department bought new radios, I believe it was six penny money. We also benefited from that purchase. Um, we now have radios in our street and alley vehicles that are compatible. Okay, perfect. Hopefully we don't have to get a chance to use that real quick. Councilman Roybal. <clears throat> just, a, just a comment um, on Richard's talk about EVs. Um, having recently retired from that industry, uh, EVs are, you know, we, to train up mechanic to, to do the EVs, you have to have all a whole separate toolbox with rubber coated, rubber boots, rubber pads, everything like that. And even though you say EV, it's an all-encompassing uh, concept, every manufacturer is just a little bit different. So in order for us to have somebody that's competent on all those, he'd spend more time training than he would working. Mm -hmm. So I I would discourage, if, if we did go into the EV market, I would send them to the uh, the, the dealerships because they basically they're under warranty for up to 100,000 miles. I would send each one to the individual dealership that had the training on it. It might cost us a little bit in the long run, but it's going to be way cheaper than uh, training and re-equipping the whole, the whole uh, department. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, if I may say, also the mechanics own their own tools. We pay them a small tool allowance, which isn't enough to for them to buy a tool once a month. But um, we do help with that. And they do, when we hire a mechanic, they bring their own tools. I, uh, Director Nemechek, I would echo what my colleague from Ward 1 just said. Uh, we had, actually are not even training EV mechanics right now in our educational pipeline because um, it's an evolving um, and very, very difficult um, in Wyoming, I think, especially because of our infrastructure. Um, I did have a question about professional development. Um, I know that uh, when I had an opportunity to visit with some of the gentlemen out at Fleet Maintenance, that they had let their ASE certifications and things go. Um, and part of that was just quite honestly, I think based on what we're able to pay and that we weren't really valuing necessarily those certifications um, and maintaining those. And so I know that uh, we went to 19,500 in 2024 as the adopted budget for professional development, which was up from 1,152. And I'm just wondering if we, how that professional development money is being used and if we are encouraging our um, mechanics and our fleet maintenance crew to maintain their certifications now um, and helping them to do that after hearing that we, you know, are paying for bar licenses um, uh, or for law licenses with their bar association fees. I really think that our mechanics um, need that same type of support. So I'm just curious as to how we're spending those professional development dollars. I couldn't agree with you more. And we do uh, want our mechanics to be certified. In fact, we pay for certifications. We pay up to for up to three certifications, up to $100 a month per certification. Getting them, the mechanics to... Uh, get certified is a different subject. We do encourage it, we pay for it, we do it. They can do it on city time, um, but we haven't been completely successful in getting them to actually do take those certifications, get them and then submit their information so that we can pay them for it. Do we monetarily incentivize them for those certifications each month like yes. we do other uh, departments? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. And do we feel like we they're able to keep up? I, the day I was there, um, they we at the, there were two of them that were reading 
uh, a manual trying to figure out a vehicle because they work on a lot of different types of vehicles mm -hmm. and equipment that is not the norm mm -hmm. of a general mechanic. And I'm just concerned that we need to give them the tools that they need in order to be as efficient as possible. Um, and I would also add that every time that we bid a vehicle, we bid training on that specific vehicle with the with the equipment. So when we receive a piece of equipment or a vehicle, we also receive training on how to how to maintain it. Great, thank you. Okay, next, any other questions from our dwindling committee? Okay, next <laughs> next one. I believe this is the last I'll, section, solid waste. Solid waste uh, enterprise fund. The solid waste fund. Oh, what page number? Oh, sorry. sorry. 248 is where it starts. Thank you. And goes through 254. Okay, thank you. The solid waste fund includes budgets for sanitation, compost facility, Happy Jack Landfill, and Belvoir Ranch. Revenue projections are based on our new fee schedule, which includes various rate increases according to our 10-year solid waste master plan. Contractual and professional services increased for both sanitation and Happy Jack Landfill. The cost of recycling single stream and household hazardous waste has increased substantially in the sanitation budget. The Happy Jack Landfill budget includes additional maintenance on our leachate system, which is our water collection system, as well as additional surveying services. We've also increased the landfill maintenance line item to pay for daily cover, which is the new foam cover that we uh, had approved recently. The largest increases in this fund, however, involve uh, revolve around equipment replacement. We plan to replace three automated and two roll-off collection trucks and sanitation, and we will replace both the D5 and D6 dozers at the Happy Jack Landfill. Um, again, pages 248 to 254, and I'm happy to answer any, any questions. It looks like Brian's gone, right? Any, okay, Councilman Roybal. When Through you. Jack. It's like Survivor here. <laughs> when we um, when we replaced the, the dozers, do we trade them in or do we just take them over, bury them too? <laughs> Through you, Chair. We we normally trade them in if we can get the the uh, vendor to accept the them. But yes, we'll we'll trade them in primarily. I don't I think we've always traded in. I don't think we've ever had one that we haven't traded in. And then my second question is now that I have some time off, can I drive one? <laughs> you want to drive the compactors, right? Not no, the I want to drive the dozer. Oh. <laughs> I think we could arrange that if your insurance is good. <laughs> Depends on if you have a license. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions for Director Nemechek? Well, thank you so much for your participation. Oh, go ahead. So you're, this is probably six, seven, eight years ago. Remember we had to do the 8% yes. raises for three for years. Five, we, five, yeah. we did it for five, but we backed out one to 5%. And it was, yes. it was brutal. It was brutal. So, but uh, that got us performing again, the uh, sanitation for, or the solid waste fund performing again. Are we still on track to not have any any issues like that again? Um, through you, Chair, we uh, have, every 10 years, we're required by the state to update our integrated solid waste management plan. And that is basically our solid waste master plan. It uh, revolves around the financial piece of, of it. Um, they, I will say that we are on track. However, I think we'll probably see something maybe a little bit higher next time around. We're only halfway through the 10 years. But with uh, the inflation that we've seen over the last few years, uh, it's possible that it could be a little higher as we as we move forward. But we're... We don't intend to do any uh, significant changes. Um, we're going to continue to uh, follow our 10-year plan, which will be the one, two, three, and 5% increases in the specific areas. Okay, with that, we will um, meet tomorrow, um, same time and same place. Uh, President Esquivel will be chairing the committee and we'll hear, be hearing from Engineering, Planning and Development and Downtown Development Authority with City Engineer Tom Cobb and Director Charles Bloom. Um, with that, we are adjourned. Have a great day.